All right, so um, Taylor, I could dive into a bit of an intro. I think most people know you. But, I need to give a brief intro, or I, I can actually do my own intro if you'd like, because at this point, I, I think many people may know me. Um, so me, I'll, go ahead. I was just going to set this up a bit um, with just saying how excited we are to have you here. And, you know, in thinking about the, the discussion you and I had about what are we going to talk about, it brought me back to uh, Jane Jacobs and the death and life of the great American city. And, in, in this great book, she wrote about how she wrote about the vitalization of cities, not necessarily revitalization, but vitalization of cities and neighborhoods and how this comes not from large scale interventions, but the accumulation of smaller actions and the environments, culture, attitude that foster uh, these kind of actions. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. it also got me thinking to the uh, Worcester Regional Com Chamber of Commerce the Regional Housing and Economic Study that was completed in, in uh, 2019. In this study, it identified the undersupply of housing as well as substandard housing as something that could potentially stall Worcester's economic growth. And you know, this group here, we're all about um, you know, the, the idea of building performance and increasing the, the standard of housing, but uh, it's great for us to geek out about the techniques, but how does this really happen in the real world? How do we break beyond? Um, we can help the projects that ask for our help, but how do we get this kind of activity going? And that that really gets us to how does development happen? So I was really curious to hear uh, Taylor's perspective on what's going on in Worcester and how do we get there? Thanks, Ken. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what I'm calling responsible incremental development. And incremental development is probably best described by uh, how Ken just talked about Jane Jacobs, the idea that it's sort of grassroots and many small interventions make up the whole mm -hmm. instead of, sort of a key top-down <laughs> approach where um, the oh. urban fabric is dictated from massive policy decisions and major flows of capital. So in general, and this is partly self-serving, but I think that empowering small developers is, is very good policy. Um, so to kind of frame this conversation, I'm gonna talk about what's happening in Worcester um, from my perspective, which of course there's a lot of different perspectives on what happens in Worcester. So I'm interested to hear what others what others think after, but um, there's sort of three, three key subjects I wanna cover. One, what I'm calling what's moving our market, which is, basically the idea that there are capital inflows um, inbound to Worcester and that's changing the landscape of, of how people relate to the housing market. But there's also a sense of renewed optimism, sort of a shedding of historical um, kind of uh, self-defeating biases about Worcester's story. But at the same time, I think most critically, we can't talk about Renaissance without talking about who lives in our housing and um, who actually affords the Worcester we're talking about in this Renaissance, because it's a Renaissance that's not evenly distributed. And the third concept being that there's a, a funny thing that seems to be happening here, um, which I, I'm taking a stab at here in this presentation, but I think it warrants significant more um, analysis that we have a, a scenario by which values escalate, but quality continues to fall in our housing stock. And anyone that can do the math knows that that eventually leads to a place where we're in an untenable situation. And then lastly, just because after doing that analysis, I became rather depressed about the prospects of our neighborhoods, um, just reframing the future and thinking about solutions that will work and that I'm optimistic for. Um, to give a tiny bit of background about who I am and, and why my perspective, um, you know, where my perspective is coming from, um, I've, I've done a lot of different things related to what I call incremental development at Worcester. Um, the background of this slide actually I, I discovered from a hand-drawn map of the Maine South that I did freshman year of college um, when I was proposing a certain funding mechanism to fund home ownership in the area. So I've, I've been interested in this type of thing for about a decade now, um, mostly born of just walking around Worcester and discovering all it had to offer. Um, but I've also played some of the roles that I think are are a little destructive. Um, I've, I've flipped houses, I've been the you know proud triple-decker homeowner who invests for value, um, not just market value. 
I've been a property manager, so I've, I've seen so much of this decay that I'm going to talk about firsthand. Uh, but I've also found a way to propose, um, you know, with some very competent partners, uh, reframing how we think about multifamily investment and kind of raising funds to make a, a neighborhood scale intervention. Then most recently, um, I've also played the role of housing developer. Um, to give you an idea of this sort of broad swath of projects that Civico works on and sort of where I spend most of my time. Um, we, we've done things at, at a variety of scales from kind of luxury condominiums to mixed income housing, transit oriented housing, and historic um, adaptive reuse. Uh, you know, infill housing in places like Newton where it's very, very market driven um, to, you know, mix, mixed income multifamily in suburban locations throughout Boston. Um, and then most recently where we're at is we're entering the low income housing tax credit um, game. We just won a project uh, at RFP in the town of Winchester depicted here next to the MBTA station across from the town common where we're proposing a, a deeply affordable multifamily project in a very wealthy neighborhood. Um, and some of our work in affordability is happening here in Worcester as well. We have a proposed tiny home village for the chronically homeless. Um, where we're trying to figure out how to how to solve for uh, the challenge of housing first in a way that um, is sort of takes some of what we've learned in the private sector and deploys it to people with fewer means. Um, but let's segue back to Worcester because um, I want to talk about Worcester's moment. So much of so much of my learning has happened here, and I think that everyone can sort of taste the palpable kind of momentum that Worcester's happening right now or has right now. And um, we're experiencing this massive inflow. And what I mean by that is that there are, there are people from outside of Worcester who are valuing Worcester differently than people from inside. And that's, a, that's an important point because um, I think much of it is actually getting exacerbated by COVID, but it was happening before too. Uh, liquidity, to use the term for money in the markets that's not tied up in any long-term assets, li liquidity needs to seek out Kind of like liquidity is hungry it needs to seek out returns and um, so there are constantly people coming into Worcester looking for opportunities to place capital and find returns and that's affecting our moment in a, a quite a bit because um, much of what's happening right now is that outsiders are buying locally because they have a slightly different frame about what value means I think there's also a more a more positive things happening, which is the intrinsic value of the city is is sort of getting recognized for the first time in, in my tenure here and maybe the first time in a couple decades. We've always had the meds and eds and the a lot of value in the city that has um, has not been reflected in our asset prices and it's also not been reflected in in the conversation and narrative about Worcester, which so often is um, you know a lot of time is spent talking about what Worcester lacks and not what what Worcester has. Um, this increased competition is is raising asset prices, and as I'll show you in a little bit, there's a there's some serious pressures on on rents, um, and so that competition is is good for sellers. It's good for people who've waited out this market for a long time, but it's not necessarily good for uh, the next 15 or 20 years. And then lastly, uh, the the moment that Worcester is having is very much not evenly distributed, and that's what I'm going to go into next. Um, because talking about any renaissance uh, absolutely requires that you talk about a renaissance for whom. Um, in the case of Worcester, uh, there's a key concept here for, and just forgive me if you, if you know this already, but basically in, in the housing business, we deal in median incomes. Um, and we can, we can frame this sort of hyper-locally, thinking about Worcester's median household income, which basically means that of the 72,000 households in Worcester, over 50% of them earn less than $50,000 a year. And a household average is about two and a half people. There's no such thing as a half a person. So, you know, maybe it's a three person household. Uh, and that income, that $50,000 is being drawn from anyone over the age of 15 in terms of how the data is collected. Um, so our median in the city, meaning that half is lower and half is higher, uh, is about $46,000. Um, but that even even in that median, the distribution isn't isn't even. There's 40 percent of uh, those people earn less than thirty five thousand dollars a year. And this is not big money. Um, it's it's very challenging, kind of no matter what your rent 
expenses are to support a family of more than one person on you know sub fifty thousand dollar a year salary or for forty percent of the city sub thirty five thousand dollars a year um, the the kind of summary being that this uh, the city has a large tranche of people who do not have significant means um, now this income distribution has an effect on housing and I'm going to do a little bit of math here which I'll walk through from top to bottom. So you take that $46,000 a year, which is again, that median household income in Worcester, and we use an, a nice 30% multiplier, which is um, sort of rule of thumb in the industry, where the assumption is that if a person uh, spends 30% or less of their gross annual income on housing, they're, they're not burdened, um, which means that we're really working with about $14,000 a year to apply to housing for 50% of Worcester's population. And if you continue on down the line, we get a, a gross housing cost figure of about 1,150, um, but we have to back out utilities just because of how, how all this calculus works. So that brings us down to the bottom line number, which is about $900, which means that it's reasonable in Worcester for half the population to pay about $900 a month. And again, we're working in median, so there's a lot of people that that's not reasonable for. But what that tells you automatically is that our population can't support a ton of uh, rent. And there's another factor that kind of gets compounded here, which is essential for the study of housing, which is how the actual median income in the city differs from what we call the area median income, which is how all decisions are made about capital A affordable housing. And I'll describe what I mean by capital A affordable housing in a second. Um, but the way that uh, area median income is calculated is based on the kind of overall area around Worcester. And it just so turns out that we have some fairly wealthy neighbors, which means that our city's median income is less than half of the median income when you consider our suburban neighbors. But what we're talking about here is the quality of housing stock in our Worcester neighborhoods. And that's not actually reflected by uh, the Shrewsbury's and the Grafton's and Boylston's that have significantly stronger earning potential. So uppercase affordable housing. This basically means affordable housing as dictated by policy. Um, it's not the type of affordable housing lowercase that is going to exist in your neighborhood just because a building hasn't had rents raised in a long time. And this becomes a really important uh, discussion when you think about different interventions in the market and how you solve for some of these problems. The uppercase affordability um, is deviating a little bit from what is actually affordable to certain tranches of people. Because when you're dealing in, in medians and, and data aggregation, you leave behind significant groups of people that, don't, uh, that aren't reflected by that. Um, so as you'll, you'll see in a second, there's a critical component here, which is related to the Section 8 voucher, which is basically a mobile subsidy that follows a tenant around and that's dictated in part by that area median income that's anchored by those wealthier suburbs. Um, so what we have, remembering that we have basically $900 a month um, for reasonable affordability for half our population here, um, we have a, a HUD housing and urban development set rent that's reasonable called the fair market rent of about $1,800. If we use the same modifier that we did a couple slides back to account for the reduction in utilities, that basically means that the market floor is set at about $1,500 because anyone who carries a voucher around, meaning the kind of most vulnerable tenants we have in this community, they can pay up to $1,500 a month. And that means that landlords sort of de facto move to that being the monthly floor rent in a community where um, even people who don't have subsidy can maybe only afford $1,000 a month or $900 a month. So, I know there's a lot of kind of data in here and it's very hard to track rapid change. One of the challenges in our industry is that we really have two major tools by which to judge how our population and demographics change. And that's the census, which is done every 10 years and the American Community Survey, which is done every five. The challenge being that um, what happens when Worcester suddenly starts uh, getting excited about itself and that happens within a five year period and the escalation is dramatic and our tools to uh, access and review 
and analyze that change are limited. Um, for this reason, I'm, I'm going to kind of give you some what I would call gut checks or sort of boots on the ground kind of understanding of, of how these numbers are playing out. So first we have the old standard. This is kind of like Worcester's standard three bedroom rent for you know 10 years and maybe even 15 years before that, which was you could really get a 900 to $950 three bedroom uh, apartment in the city. And I, I just double checked, I, I got to Worcester in 2010. So I checked the 2011 fair market rent and it looks like when you account for utilities, it's roughly that same $900. Um, so it sounds like before we experienced our renaissance, the kind of market rent was roughly equivalent to both what a tenant could pay based on their income, but also based on what HUD determined was fair market. Now we're in a different condition now, what I'm gonna call the new standard, which I said was approximately $1,500 a month uh, set by that fair market rent figure from HUD. Now, we can back into that same number by looking at what it costs to buy a triple decker today, which is about $450,000. And you'll have to trust me on this because I don't wanna have to show the math, but basically rule of thumb is that your monthly rental amount is about 1% of your purchase price in order to achieve a 10% cash on cash return. Now this is important again, because we're trying to think like the market. So I want to show that you basically need to yield $1,500 a month to pay for a triple decker in today's market. Now we're already starting to deviate from what we think our community can afford. So let's talk a little bit about one of the key assets in our community. The triple decker is kind of the Swiss army knife of housing. It's played so many different historical roles. Um, Originally, it was actually sort of a speculative asset built to accommodate the tremendous inflows of, of labor to an industrializing city. They've subsequently played a really important role in um, multi-generational immigrant housing, uh, wealth building for homeowners, uh, student housing, et cetera. They're, they're ubiquitous. Um, we have about 5,000 of them in the city and, and many more throughout the Commonwealth um, and all the way up to Montreal. Um, and they're very flexible. They uh, can they appeal to both homeowners and novice and sophisticated investors. So it's an, it's an interesting asset class where you have many potential candidates to purchase and own. Um, and each one of those candidates has sort of a, a unique impact on the triple decker and a unique impact on the neighborhood. Lastly, uh, they're a little bit dated in terms of their design. I think specific to some of the numbers I portray to you later, uh, we think about part of the role of the triple decker in the future um, is not just becoming more energy efficient or more code compliant, but it's also about more usable just based on uh, contemporary needs, particularly related to the, the kitchen and bath configuration, which if you've been in a triple decker, you know that your kitchen is about three and a half feet wide, um, which is a, you know, that's a limiting factor for, for many people and a limiting factor for the sort of competitiveness of this housing type in the future. So this triple decker, I think there is a problem and I'm gonna describe that problem. And I think it's telling us as sort of like the bellwether of our community that there is an issue here that we're not addressing and we don't exactly have the tools to address. So what I'm gonna go into next sort of follows this trend. I'm gonna describe something that I call amplifiers. These are basically uh, market effects that end up having a, an impact on rising rents while also depreciating the quality of a building. And then the output here is that the market price ends up deviating from the true value. I'll describe what I, what I mean by that, but, but this presentation follows basically this, this output. And then the, the summary of what happens here is we, we develop a, a systemic threat to our socioeconomic fabric as well as our asset quality. So I'm gonna use a sort of simple dollar for dollar model here to describe value because it's important to, to decouple the concept of market value from what I'm calling actual asset value. Um, and they're different in, in that, let's think about a building from its benchmark year as sort of having a certain amount of health. And that health depreciates over time with age. Um, you know, the average age of a triple decker is 117 years old in the city. That compares with nationally, the average age of uh, single family housing stock is something like 37 years old. So we already are, we have a particularly old subset of housing on our hands. And so it's sort of expected that there will be some challenges related to kind of declining quality over time. 
And we can already see that the, the specter of the market and speculation is sort of looming here, irrespective of the depreciation in asset quality. And the assumption here is that hypothetically, one dollar of depreciation is recoverable with one dollar of investment. So if you know if if you're building ages by five dollars, if you put in five dollars, you could recover five dollars of health. Now we know that's not exactly how it works in the real world, but it's essential to kind of understanding what we're up against here. Um, so to talk about the amplifiers, there's number one, this is the broadest and most complicated, I think, is just the market in general, um, which is the broadest deviation from the cost to repair as a governor of value. So basically we have we have kind of three options. We have our, our key true value, which I'm calling the actual value of the asset, which is based on what it costs to get it to good health. But we have a market that could ascend in value or could decline. And um, that volatility is, is fairly regular and well known in the economy. And it's a, it's a given that we have no means of overcoming, but it's not necessarily correlated uh, to the true value of the asset as, as understood by its kind of cost to repair and cost to bring it to quote good health. A second key amplifier we have is um, one of insufficient wealth. And this is really interesting because it sort of applies to different categories of, of owners differently. Um, but if you were to think about this in terms of a homeowner, um, you know, there's a lot of DIY fixes that get done or unpermitted work. Um, costs that are spent on the project to generate curb appeal versus kind of durable building system improvements. Um, and what, what's sort of interesting, and this, this might be unique to this market, but I'm not sure, the, the market doesn't really correct for poor workmanship. What we, what we see on the ground is that um, basically a, a veneer of good finishes is priced the same as a completely finished product. And that becomes really important when you think of the age of these buildings and the number of potentially uh, catastrophic failures that can occur related to systems. The insufficient wealth component is also somewhat related to the kind of history of depressed property values in the city. Um, what, what has happened historically is that um, most, most property owners, uh, most homeowners and small investors, uh, they don't necessarily have a significant amount of cash to deploy. So many significant building improvements are actually funded by appreciating building value. But when you have a city like Worcester that for so long had uh, relatively low property values, uh, there's, there's no way to tap the value of the appreciating home to pay for those necessary fixes. So we've had a sort of chronic problem of an asset class that's by its very nature undercapitalized. Then we have the flipping mentality and this buy low and sell high um, although good for the person buying low and selling high, can be really extractive to the community and can have some sort of uh, significant impacts because the incentive is to basically make repairs that look good for the lowest possible price. But then the incentive is also to sell to the homeowner at the maximum price the market will bear. Um, now, not all flips are good flips. And so when you think about sort of the impact of that effect over time, it can be very challenging for what's behind the things you can see. This also applies to any investor who's going to be uh, buying or investing in basically any small scale multifamily housing stock. Basically the, the time horizon is just not big enough to account for some of those really long-term, those, uh, those important kind of systems that affect long-term health of the building. Most people are investing for short-term returns. And I'm thinking about you know, five to 10 years is still considered, considered short-term when you think of the endurance of this building class over, uh, over the last century. There's a challenge with unsophisticated investors overpaying simply because uh, their incentive is not to, uh, the, the people that are consulting for them are not incentivized to you know, drive prices down. They're incentivized to drive prices up. And so many decisions end up getting, um, you know, kind of outsourced to people who don't really understand exactly the implications of overpaying and starting with such a high debt burden. Then the sophisticated investor, although they may recognize intrinsic value, they're beholden to delivering returns, which is pretty challenging when you're stuck up against, uh, you have two tools to deliver returns. A, you can kind of drive rent increases or you can not spend dollars on repairs. So that's automatically a, a feedback loop that generates sort of a depression for the asset over time in quality of investment. 
And then lastly, just kind of more macro, housing as a commodity has always been a challenge um, because the, you know, the, the actual person in that commodity is really the thing that the person that is subject to some of these decisions. But uh, investors tend to think about housing as the product. And if housing is the product, not uh, the quality of the experience in the housing, then decisions about deferring maintenance are relatively easy to think about. So some things that are really getting missed in the market price, because um, again, the thesis here being that there's there's a remarkable lack of accuracy in market pricing for the assets. Um, just some key things that came to mind. Hardscape and landscape are virtually completely omitted. I mean, Worcester is a city of seven hills, and I think there's more than seven hills in the city. Many triple deckers and many houses are built on those hills, and they require significant earthwork and retainage. And those factors are basically 100% omitted from market price. It virtually doesn't matter uh, to the kind of market value of something if your retaining wall needs to be replaced in five years and will, will, will cost you know, thirty to $50,000. It's just not part of the computation. Masonry uh, is, is another part of that related to chimneys and foundations specifically. Um, I think they tend to be, they fall in the category of problems that are too big for people to think about. Um, because in a market like Worcester, no one is jacking up a house and building a new foundation. You go to Portland, Oregon, and every single person has managed to jack up their house and build a new foundation and an ADU just because the market price has been able to bear it. Um, issues related to hazards to health, lead, asbestos, mold, et cetera, um, these are huge, and they're also easy to cover. You can cover up mold, you can cover up lead and asbestos. And so when costs to remediate are high, and the economic incentive is so low because you don't really get a more rentable building. You can't yield more dollars if it if you're telling the tenant in this market, at least, that it doesn't have hazardous materials. So there's no real incentive to do it right. And finally, the mechanical, electrical and plumbing. Um, I mean, anything that lives behind a wall. This is a, a classic case of it, it being very easy to hide things. Um, I think this is possible for a few things, for a few reasons. Number one. People buy for speculation. If you anticipate the market price is going to escalate significantly enough, uh, then you know near-term concerns about cost are insignificant. There's also a knowledge imbalance related to the people who work on the ground and actually understand um, sort of the mechanics of the type of housing versus the people who are buying and making decisions about deploying capital. Uh, they're sort of an expert. There, there's a the people who are involved in making decisions are experts about the things they're not supposed to be making a decision about. What I mean by that is like the person who's deploying, say, an investor's dollar, um, their goal is to generate returns, not pay tons of attention to whether or not a building is in, quote, good health. And this, I think, is easily or exacerbated by problems of being out of sight and out of mind. Um, stuff hidden behind walls is easily ignored. Plumbing stacks are easily ignored because they're buried in chases. And as long as the fixture, the veneer, looks good, then it's rentable. And as long as it's rentable, the returns are delivered until colossal failure. So this is, uh, you know, again, just a series of feedback loops, and they are probably exacerbated by inadequate enforcement. Uh, the city of Worcester has, has suffered because um, it sort of changed its tune. Historically, it let virtually everything pass by, and now they're trying to modernize and develop a better enforcement strategy. But the general populace, especially those in the building trades, have a certain expectation that anything goes. And the problem is uh, changing that behavior comes with a cost. Now, the final point, which I think is sort of endemic to this whole concept, is that failure is a marathon, not a sprint. Everyone can bet that this failure won't happen when they own it. Um, and that becomes a problem kind of system-wide versus uh, on an asset-by-asset -asset basis. So the impact to the triple-decker, um, when you think about you know, one building may have suffered any of these ailments over the last 125 years, there's two key takeaways. The market value and the cost of repair exceeds the actual market value of the improved building. That's one significant problem. And the second is that sedimentary bad decisions make incremental improvements ineffective. What I mean by that is um, exemplified by, say, for example, how someone handles asbestos siding. If you side over lead, uh, lead painted clabbered with some kind of asphalt, and then three decades later, asbestos, and then two decades later, vinyl. Um, you can't just solve for the asbestos because you now have four layers of siding. It's going to be a significant job. Same thing happens on the roof. Um, you know, you can't just fix one foot of your plumbing stack. You have to fix the whole thing. Uh, 
So the problem becomes you can't, to go back to our simple economic model, you can't just put a dollar in to get your building one dollar healthier. You sometimes have to spend 20 or 30 dollars to make your building significantly healthier. So the problem being we're pretty close when you think about current market values and what it costs to the million dollar Worcester triple decker, which just basically means that even if it's healthy, then it becomes very, very expensive to live in. And that's, uh, that's a, a, big, a big problem, I think. Um, and it's a, it's a systemic problem that we're all going to grapple with eventually because the bill does come due. And if the market values aren't accurately pricing the chronic problems and there's really no incentive or indication that the market will incentivize accurate pricing, um, we have sort of an unfunded pension problem, which is that you can pass it on to future generations, but the passing of the baton doesn't actually solve your problem. Um, and perhaps, you know, there will be a solution in the future, but that's skating on pretty thin ice. Um, the market likes to make it a wealth problem because the market can pretty effectively raise rent and squeeze the renter because the kind of uh, negative externalities to the renter show up in other places that the market doesn't see immediately. It shows up in, uh, you know, lower performance in school or higher health costs due to, you know, the social determinants of health um, shows up in places that our market doesn't price very well. Now the market does compress investor returns to an extent and the sort of nationwide compression of investor returns causes people to capital to flow to markets like Worcester to sort of normalize the headache. So everyone gets the headache. Um, and it really, it introduces new capital with like a one-way pricing incentive. It can only price assets higher because you're making, uh, you're comparing your returns, thinking, you know, okay, well, returns are better than they are in NYC, but that doesn't make the returns or like the idea a good idea for Worcester. Because you can't just raise rents. Um, theoretically, we can't support indefinite rental hikes because the data doesn't suggest we're also having indefinite um, growth of incomes, especially when you're not addressing chronic building health problems. Um, and it's also unknown if, Worcester can sustain that without population turnover. There was a really kind of big discussion about um, Worcester in the last two years uh, of gentrification and the idea that, well, all the new de development does is it introduces a whole new population. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you really can't, you can't assume unless you have a commensurate increase in incomes that uh, rents can run away. So the thesis here is that we, we have a runaway train problem and, um, there's a structural misalignment of incentives. That structural misalignment of incentives in the market creates an upward pressure on rent, but it also kind of, oddly enough, exacerbates the undercapitalization of the buildings themselves. So as I was thinking about this, it, it came to me that what I'm describing is like the prototypical uh, definition of, of the asset bubble, um, which made me think of the triple decker as Worcester's collateralized debt obligation from the 2008 financial crisis. Basically what happens when the underlying asset ceases to have actual intrinsic value? It's, a, it's an interesting question that, that begs some conversation here because um, you know history tells us that good things don't happen when the asset price deviates so significantly. There's a couple tools that the market has to uh, quote, recalibrate the base value. And these triggers are, are sort of funny because they're, they're subsidies in a way, they're just not government subsidies as we think about them. They're like second and third order government subsidies. So the first is that one of the one of the best ways to make a, a healthier building is to have a colossal fire or um, you know water damage loss because um, the insurance company through the insurance float is essentially subsidizing getting that building back to uh, tip top shape. Foreclosure does a similar thing where it wipes out all those lien holders, and so the lien holders are subsidizing getting that building back to a basis that's reasonable for the amount of repair needed. Um, or you could have just a systemic market correction like 08 when kind of across the board, we just deflate. Um, but these all have tremendous uh, negative externalities associated with them. Um, but, you know, oddly enough, they tell us a little bit about subsidy being the key tool here that we have in our current market, um, which means to me that maybe we should think more about uh, direct government subsidy here. The problem is we have some tools and they're just not enough. Um, Worcester Housing Now put together a program that kind of pooled existing subsidy programs uh, through the state and federal government in order to kind of address this issue of the chronically undercapitalized triple decker, which uh, as Ken had mentioned was sort of uh, came out of that housing study he mentioned earlier. 
And, you know, they put together this tremendous program for investors and owner occupants. And um, my discussion with the gentleman in charge of the program indicates that there's the vast majority of people taking this subsidy are uh, existing owner occupants. Now, that's great to an extent, uh, but there are many, many buildings in the city where those existing owner occupants have no debt. They're multi generational structures. And um, although the subsidy gets the building back online, so to speak, and adds more supply to the market, it doesn't really solve this mechanism that is resulting in the ever escalation of housing prices. So we clearly need a better policy level or lever and um, definitely a better execution strategy than what we have today because subsidy is sort of too little, too late. Currently, um, if you look at my little triple decker style uh, uh, table here, um, thinking of this kind of unitized unit one, unit two, unit three for an aggregate building here, this is what it takes in the current market to um, buy at market value $450,000 to spend about $300,000, thinking in median terms here, for a total basis of $750,000. That will get us, if we bought today on the market, an existing building and then made it in great health. Um, to support that, using what I had described earlier, which is my rule of thumb for, for real estate investing, that takes about $750 or $7,500 a month in rent, which is equivalent to $2,500 a month per unit. And that's clearly just not tenable. So what that means right now is at current mar market pricing um, and kind of currently acceptable investor returns, there is no way to generate a building that is up to snuff. Now, if we were to maximize for current subsidy, but also adjusting for reasonable rent, that figure that is roughly $1,000 per unit, that we think uh, the majority of our Worcester renter population can afford, then we're at a $3,000 a month gap um, that either has to be subsidized on the capital side, meaning when you actually invest in the building, or it has to be subsidized on the renter side. Now, either way, we're stuck with a gap. And, uh, you know, I, I think that ultimately we're probably talking about a combination of state, local, and federal packaged. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But I went through this thinking about like, okay, if I gave myself a pop quiz and I said several statements, all of which kind of required everyone's utmost attention, um, which one would not be true? And it turns out when I look at the, the four pieces I have here, number one, if you wanna achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, you have to turn over about 100,000 energy retrofits a year for the next 30 years in mass. Uh, number two, the market demands that renovation costs are passed on to home buyers or renters. Number three, a vast majority of the renter demographic is already housing cost burdened in Worcester. And number four, existing housing subsidy programs don't scale down effectively, meaning they work great for a 40, you know, 45 unit light tech project. They don't really work great for a series of triple deckers. The problem with all the statements is they're very much all true. And each one of them requires its own uh, intervention. So I think to transition to a more positive note um, and thinking about how we can fix this problem, there's something that came to mind when I was reading that the idea of doing things that don't scale. So basically flying in the face of Harvard Business School and the idea that um, all good solutions are scalable solutions. I think that in order for us to think about saving the vitality of our neighborhoods, in Worcester and beyond, we have to think about solutions that are hyper-local and that there's not a necessary, there's, there's not an imperative to scale to make them work. Um, there are examples all over this country because there are extremely capable people everywhere that I think that the question becomes, how do you deliver them the tools to deliver on what they're already envisioning is the right decision for their neighborhood or their community? But I think what we lack right now is we're in a, a, a period where there are ample tools at scale there are very, very few tools at the smaller scale. It's not a lack of actors able to actually capitalize on the opportunity. It's a lack of tools to those actors at this scale. So small scale developers really matter. And I think they matter for a couple of reasons. One, I'm calling them kind of low overhead and high touch. Basically what I mean by that is they, you know, they don't have a tremendous company and tremendous bureaucracy. Uh, they're high touch with what they invest in. Instead of delegating the care to someone else, they care. And that ends up really mattering in this case when you make a decision with, uh, you know, neighborhood-based investment. You know, something as simple as like, do I pave over my front lawn in Worcester, which, believe it or not, is a problem that has um, been vocalized over the last probably five years. Uh, because if you 
say have three or five multifamily buildings in a neighborhood, you are going to care about whether or not there's still a street tree. You're going to care about whether there's curb appeal that doesn't make you feel like you live in an urban jungle. Um, you know, that doesn't translate very well to the person who's deploying capital from, you know, a centralized location and is thinking in terms of spreadsheets and numbers. Um, small developers also enable an alignment of financial incentives with quality of life factors. So it's thinking about the community that they're building and how that affects their asset and quality of life over time, instead of, again, thinking of housing strictly as a commodity, in which case it's all comparison basis. But most importantly, I think it's an opportunity for the real estate sector to think about diversifying what matters and kind of reclaiming the idea of value from the market. So often we are stuck in sort of the, the black hole of market value being the only value. And if you can't monetize it, then you're stuck with an argument that's hollow and you can't claim that it's important. Now, we all know that's not actually true because there are things, you know, you're not, you're not going to uh, put a dollar figure on why walking in a neighborhood in the west side of Worcester feels better than it does walking in, you know, Cambridge Street in Worcester. But there are factors that are not monetizable about why one experience is more enjoyable than another and feels better and has implications for quality of life. So we have made an attempt ourselves with the Bell Hill Opportunity Fund in Worcester um, to uh, create an intervention that, that makes sense and has a uh, possible impact. So this just historical sense of what the old triple deckers looked like. They had ornament um, porches. You know, they lacked paint. Um, this this photo actually comes with an interesting quote saying they all looked rather dilapidated because they needed a paint job. Now, if only the person in 1911 writing that could have seen today um, what our portfolio looks like when we bought it. This is just a Google Street View capture of um, the significant degradation after, you know, 100 plus years of how those triple deckers with sort of something called character uh, have been utterly butchered. And, um, you know, we, we envisioned an alternative and that alternative really was about thinking about how we could deploy capital that cared more about uh, the long-term impact in the neighborhood. And we did that by uh, extending the time horizon. So in the investment world, uh, investors typically want to see their money turnover. They want to see multiples of their equity rather quickly. And we changed the narrative a little bit and described uh, the triple decker neighborhoods as sort of like a fundamentally very low risk uh, annuity style asset, where if you bring capital in, then over time it drives kind of lower risk, steady returns. And by doing that, it allows us to justify economically that it makes sense for us to uh, make building improvements that are durable for, you know, the next 50 years. Now, in the absence of being able to get capital aligned with the goals of the actual day-to-day -day neighborhood experience, you're basically unable to make those decisions if you're looking for a short-term exit. Um, so I can talk about that more after, but I think we're a little low on time. Um, so let's just go through a couple of kind of takeaways from our little urban exploration. Um, number one, capital inflow should definitely not be conflated with success. And I think this is the this is the single biggest failing of the Worcester Renaissance at the moment is um, a hyper focus on inbound investment and not thinking about what investment actually does because the devil's really in the details. Um, and a uh, takeaway critical to this group, I think, is that siloing whatever these adverse market conditions are is very unhelpful because it, it limits sort of cross-sector collaboration. Um, I think one of the three things that we should really talk about together because I think they're all married concepts are gentrification, quality of the housing stock, and then climate pressure. Um, and I think we we potentially have an opportunity, especially with the type of people that are interested in, in this call, because if you change the frame of reference, since this is fundamentally a framing problem, um, climate might actually be that sort of Trojan horse that helps us reframe this uh, speculate, rent, and depreciate dynamic, because the climate problem is, so big that it's managed to change the typical market first thinking. And if we can sort of ride that wave and recognize that as the sort of overarching narrative has changed, we also can change our narrative about how to solve neighborhood housing stock. Um, applying that, I think there are several things that we understand to be true. Government intervention is absolutely necessary. The gaps are too big to be met by the market alone. Um, but at the same time, market innovation is critical because there's no way to create just like the affordable housing monster, such as LIHTC, um, 
at the small neighborhood scale. So it has to be a meeting in the middle. Um, and then there's also room for all types of stakeholders and all types of solutions. Um, I think that, you know, ideally it's a, it's a problem of resource allocation and how we deploy the right tools to the people who already want to change their communities. Um, so I'd love to hear what everyone has to say. I appreciate you getting through that with me. Um, I'm kind of a housing geek, so for those of you who might not be, I applaud your stamina. But Ken, can I hand it back to you? Uh, sure, well, I'd, I'd like you to keep going. That was fantastic. Really refreshing and, and great context. I don't know whether to be elated and excited or just to curl up and cry. I'm with I'm you. depressed. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one of the things you touched on is, you know, is um, you know, basically a failure of the of the market to correctly value things, and right, that that's a big thing. And maybe it's it's valuing it. At, as commodity, but not valuing it as housing or as the physical asset. What kind of strategies are there to to get a little bit of reconciliation um, to true value of the asset? Well, I think it's uh, that's a that's a big question. And quite honestly, when I had when I had written to you the couple sentences that introduced what I wanted to talk about. I hadn't yet realized that I wasn't going to come up with what I consider plausible solutions. So it was sort of a bait and switch in that I described that I thought there were better solutions than I came up with. Um, and I, I think that the challenge being that, like with the Bell Hill Opportunity Fund, which was our kind of, to my knowledge, like one of the more targeted efforts in the city to try that at scale, um, you know, the only way we met our goals was by riding the market up. And we captured that rental appreciation at a really critical moment. So it's sort of a relic of the days past. So what I, what I mean by that is that that solution, that intervention we came up with, with the whatever, 20 buildings and 75 units, um, that's no longer a solution we can deploy. So that's what I, I, I come back to this idea that we need a, I mean, if I were to throw out a big idea and say, how do I think this works? I think we need a, like an, an office of small development that basically churns out droves of Jane Jacob style educated people who are empowered to change their communities. That's really what I think needs to happen. Um, you know, now what they do when they're out changing their communities, well, I think that they need to hold their elected officials accountable to figuring out how to subsidize um, this type of development because Worcester, I mean, Worcester's problem is like the Northeast problem, which is just that our housing stock is super old, so you can't treat it like California. This is a this is a very kind of localized problem. Like, of course, it makes sense that the market value has deviated from the actual asset value. A hundred years is a long time to have renters beating up your house and mold and bugs and fires. I mean, like, what did we expect, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess there's an intolerance for depreciation and right? an expectation that we're entitled to appreciation of the asset. But, uh, yeah, there's a, Wes and I use the, you know, the idea that when we talk about buildings, it may be a 200 year building, but it's built with 10, 15 and two year components. Um, so it, it will depreciate over time. Um, does anybody else have any ideas or, or reactions? I, I don't want to monopulate the discussion here. Did I just make up a word? <laughs> you're I was Googling it right now, Ken. I'm going to monopulate the, the discussion. Monopulate. <laughs> when you're talking about the different components coming to the end of life, and when, Taylor, when you're looking at your slide there that showed the different buildings, they must have been really leaky buildings because there looks like you know pints of beer and each beer was filled was spilling more beer. So each beer you know was uh, getting lower and lower. You see, I'm getting thirsty now, right? It's coming up towards the end of the day. But you can see like the value going down because of there was less less color inside each one of the buildings. We do a thing where it's kind of similar to that, where you're looking at what is the actual value of the building and it's brick and mortar value, not not what the actual property value is down in Manhattan, and it's called facility condition index and part of that is to look at 
when is it a decision to, when does the decision come to actually say, it's time to actually take this building down? That is no longer, doesn't have a historical value and it's not loved by the community or by the owner for some reason. What is the time to actually take that down? Have you had to have those like moments yourself with the buildings you're looking at where you had to make that decision? And would you like, to, would you go through that? Yeah, so it, it's an interesting question because I actually am a staunch supporter of not taking down this type of neighborhood housing stock because of another problem we have, which is, I think, a, a mismatch of zoning to our community needs. And that's changing in some communities, but you can't put back the same level of density that you took down. And we need density in our neighborhoods because good density, as again, to reference Jane Jacobs, it, you know, eyes on the street is critical to the, the overall sense of a community. and you know, good walkable neighborhoods mean you need proximity and you can't spread that out. So there's sort of a, there's like a locked in time level of density in these inner city neighborhoods. And if you start knocking them down, unless you do like a wholesale urban renewal style neighborhood raising, you're not getting the same density back. So I think it's really essential to preserve like the neighborhood as the unit of analysis. Um, and furthermore, there's just, I mean, a place like Worcester, property values can't support new construction anyway, which is like the corollary to our brick and mortar value being higher than market value. Um, so there, there's a number of factors that result in that being a non-starter regardless of where you start. That is one of the benefits of keeping something existing is that you could upgrade it over time in chunks versus having to tear down do new construction, you need the capital all up front right now today. Sure. You can phase it out. Let's see something. Let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, Taylor, very, very well presented. I enjoy it. But I'd like to throw out something that is uh, probably not in the foreseeable future, but it's something that um, will affect cities like Worcester that have an old housing stock um, and maybe one of those equalizers that you talked about in terms of fire or foreclosure is that when you do a building you have a depreciation schedule um 27 years or whatever uh, and that you take that off your income tax as a, as a deduction depreciation you recapture it obviously when you sell it but what if you have mechanical equipment if you're a manufacturer and you depreciate your equipment over five years or ten years whatever the equipment is and then that equipment has no value and you no longer can take any depreciation for that equipment. But in housing, strangely enough, you buy a, uh, in your case, a three family for um, $200,000 and you own it for 10 years and you depreciate it, um, well, let's say you own it for 20 years. So you depreciated the, the value of that property on your ownership, but then you go out and sell it for $400,000 and that without doing any improvements to that property that becomes a new depreciation schedule so the next owner now depreciates four hundred thousand dollars over the next 25 years or whatever and then he sells it for seven hundred thousand dollars and that starts depreciating it again so the irs kind of supports um this inflationary uh spiral that goes up if you take out an old housing stock and if you wanted to cultivate uh, the renovation and the upgrading of the old housing stock, if it's depreciated from the IRS perspective, there is no value left. So therefore, you're not selling it for the market value. You're selling it for the depreciated value. It's like a piece of machinery that you then junk or sell it to Czechoslovakia or whatever at a much lower price than a new piece of equipment. But how can we... Um, just say, okay, it's like a brand new building again, and we're going to start the depreciation schedule all over again when you haven't put any improvement. So a solution would be that you uh, can depreciate the improvements, not the existing that's already been depreciated. And this is a typical commercial uh, application for manufacturers that they appreciate and are encouraged to buy new equipment um, by the IRS. So they depreciate existing equipment and then they buy new new equipment. So what do you think about that as a long-term kind of vision of how to um, keep the uh, acquisition price at a lower number? I think it 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 makes it makes sense, but I wonder 
it doesn't affect the experience on the ground, right? It's one of those kind of esoteric concepts, taxation, that doesn't necessarily have a, a palpable uh, impact on like the problems you face every single day. It affects a balance sheet and affects, you know, your overall income. Um, I mean, but if anyone who just filed their taxes recognizes like the dollar that you write on your 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 income tax doesn't really necessarily equate to what you what you deployed in purchasing power or in you know in resources in that year. So I don't, it, it's an interesting question, and I, I think that I I don't understand enough about um, the tax code to know how the tax code is sort of pulling strings or not on all of this. But it's a it's a valuable point. It, yeah, I don't think it's something in the near future, but I think it's something that the real estate industry would probably fight tooth and nail. But it, it's a way of, uh, you know, dealing with this uh, deterioration that has lost its real value. And how do we uh, encourage the small scale developers to take over a building uh, and renovate it um, from an acquisition point of view? So it, it's it, it's an interesting concept. I don't know, I don't know where it would go on the short term, but Frank, it's I think it's fantastically interesting what you talked about. And yes, of course, it would get a lot of resistance from uh, the commodity market. Um, but it's the idea. Taylor mentioned the concept of aligning incentives with intended results, and if there is less depreciation that one can legally take out of a property then there's less return so there's less value to the asset and that would help to correct prices so there's i think there's you know there like we mentioned at the beginning the idea of the environment that creates the, the situation we're in and think of it as these uh, forces big forces beyond our control but some of it is just the technic techno technocracy, is that a word? The technocratic policies and, and decisions of you know tax codes and how they're enforced. And that's it turns out having a big to have a big effect. What about insurance? Uh, people to get financing they need insurance. So if the insurance that that is a suddenly that's a sophisticated player. There's no excuse why they wouldn't have people to be able to appropriately value and recognize that retaining wall is going to fall down in five years. We don't want to ensure that, or we're going to impose a premium for that risk. That could happen, and it's it's not a sea change, but that certainly would cause a sea change in values of real estate. Well, Ken, along with the Department of Defense, the insurance companies were some of the early adopters for recognizing the impacts of climate change. The Department of Defense being as a threat multiplier and insurance companies being as a way of uh, managing their future premium payouts. So I think, I mean, I, I think that is something huge in the next probably decade and a half that um, my assumption is that they're scrambling to keep up with understanding how they're going to uh, transition their customers to a world that the impacts are more drastic in certain areas and, and there's a cost associated. Well, in terms of sustainability, you know, uh, I think there was a, uh, under the Reagan administration, there was accelerated depreciation uh, and, and therefore companies were actually buying buildings just for the depreciation, forgetting about the value of the property. The depreciation was the value. And so in, in that respect, if, if you want to deal with uh, upgrading buildings to make them more sustainable, it would be a way of having uh, the IRS once again come in and say, okay, all the uh, heat pumps or uh, geothermal or solar or whatever, you, you know, try to make the building more sustainable are depreciated over a five-year period instead of adding to the building on a 27-year uh, period. So it would be an encouragement to put in some sustainable uh, uh, equipment that would reduce your carbon footprint. But, and I'm optimistic that the Biden administration would look at something like this as part of their overall plan. So we should keep uh, our, our ear, to the, ear to the rail, as they say. How about somebody else? Neil, you've been in housing for a while. You got some thoughts? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, Taylor. I thought your it's a uh, really interesting analysis you've done. Um, kind of, uh, you know, touching on a lot of 
a lot of different aspects from you know from economics to sustainability and uh, it stirs up lots and lots of thoughts in my in my head um, and having been involved with affordable housing for quite a while um, there's always this issue this um, issue of you know housing as a as a commodity versus housing as a sort of a, a service or housing um, as a resource um, and you know how, how affordable housing is valued is um, uh, well it's I mean it's it's just really interesting and as as an, as economic forces I think change um, as, as it, Ken you said is you know sea change um, as the sea changes I think sometimes the the boat of housing you know uh, is it does it's it tends to not react very well to the sea changes sometimes or sometimes it will list way over to one side and then way over to another side because um, our economic changes can happen I think in some ways more quickly than real estate and um, physical construction changes happen so I don't know I did, you, you stirred up a, a lot of thoughts in my head particularly I mean you know I guess from a classical economic point of view um, you know one might say well how does Taylor know whether the housing market is being valued properly or not and I'm not I'm not saying this to attack you in any way but you know a classical economic economist would say well the market knows what what the value is whether it's because you know whether it's based on there being an influx of um, outsiders to Worcester who are uh, gentrifying or whether it's it's because of uh, deferred maintenance on houses and and they're not really you know they're, they they're like polishing a turd or you know they're making things more fancy than than uh, they really are and there's decay on the inside so um, but I, I was thinking about the value of housing and to some extent because maybe many of us are involved in housing development or technology you know sustainability um, this issue of housing as a commodity and also but also the idea of valuing housing um, are we valuing housing in some ways as as uh, let's say real estate professionals, we're valuing housing more than we're valuing people, and the and the people and the the needs that people have. In other words, does the ordinary person? I know ordinary people would like to live in a comfortable house that has a good heating system and has low utility bills, but do they do they really care so much about whether they've got um, a passive house or or not? Do they just want to raise their kids? <laughs> And um, and another corollary to that, and I'm throwing out a bunch of ideas that are not cooked at all, but um, I'm thinking a, a lot of your analysis seem to look at uh, the value of the resource, the value of the housing and the, and the communities. But you know, the flip side to look at it is, what about the um, the income, I guess, or the you know the income side, the the uh, the resource size, and if if wealthier people are coming into Worcester or investing in Worcester um, you know you could say well isn't that a good thing for Worcester because um, the per capita income will go up or the median income will go up uh, of course it leaves all the people that are there now struggling you know and will they be able to keep up and will their will their incomes go up nearly as quickly as the gentrifiers come up um, that's always a problem it, it, you know it happened in the South End and anywhere in, in the Boston area and many other places too, um, but the problem the problem that is always comes up and, about and that is what is happening. But you're yes. also getting people getting poor, and what people are doing is they're renting out rooms in their triple deckers. Right. So they have right. three bedrooms, and they're renting out. And there are even some cases where people are renting out rooms on an hourly basis, not for prostitution, but by work shifts. So somebody gets a room for eight hours, and then the second shift comes in and gets it for the second eight hours, and then the third shift comes in. So you have a continued polarization of income in order to afford these unaffordable uh, rents. Right, and and just and one last thought because my my thoughts are all over the place, but the um, the impact of uh, 
you know, government sponsored of uh, tax credit projects or public housing or other programs that attempt to take housing and do take housing sort of out of the out of the market. Um, you know, the critique of that is always, well, well, yeah, that's fine. But what do you do when you, you can you, you start to create sort of a permanent underclass yeah. of people that can only afford to rent? In, you know, they, they can't afford to live in the community unless they're unless they're uh, in the shelter of uh, nonprofit sponsored housing or or public housing or something like that. And so it's just, a you know, it's a terrible uh, dilemma of what to do and how to address these issues. But again, kind of going back to housing as a commodity versus as a service. So, you know, that's it's you you bring up about the same number of points that I think we should all talk about here as this presentation. It's these are good subjects that need to be covered. The one thing that occurs to me is I, I wholly agree with your point about macroeconomics. But my my counterpoint to that being that I think macroeconomics is learning that it also doesn't know what's going on. Um, and so as we evolve, I think that's it's becoming more palatable to people to to be able to posit that you can actually see what's going on. And this is, you know, a fractional observation within, you know, an environment that probably has myriad other competing observations. But I I'm kind of with you that in theory, I or we shouldn't know what's going on. But there's I think that's why I described the market as a specter. There's like there's something else amiss here mm -hmm. that is not reflective. And um, it could just be information imbalance, right? I mean, it's quite possible that the efficient market assumes that um, there's efficient dissemination of information, right? And well, right. maybe that's just not true. <laughs> um, but I think to the point about the, what's very interesting and worth talking about is the bifurcation along the lines of wealth, the haves and the have nots. And when you, when you develop housing, like the housing we're talking about, um, it's bifurcating along the lines of people that need government assistance to support or to, to live in what's available and those who don't. And I guess that's one way, but I'm just not sure that's the way we want to go. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah, do you have some thoughts for us? Thank sure, you, Ken. <laughs> I mean, just kind of some peripheral thoughts here. Um, you know, housing is not not my specialty. I'm kind of just a dumb engineer. Um, but I, I I did really appreciate the how you backed out um, from people the median wage and utility costs and stuff like that. And so I guess my thoughts are like, how do you affect the other end of that equation where you have you know wages kind of defining what people can rent? So is that you know, is there is minimum wage play a role in that? And then there's also utility costs. So if, if you're affecting the utility, you know, the cost of utilities um, through, I guess, just, you know, good, efficient upgrades, um, obviously it's not going to, it's not going to bridge that gap that you're just, you're talking about, but it, it might get you, you know, 10, 20% of the way there, which, which I think, you know, is, is a kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Well, it all helps when you're talking about someone who's choosing between keeping a roof over their head and something related to their child's education, right? Everything yeah. matters significantly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm totally with you. I think the the question just sort of becomes, um, it this isn't. I have a very meager window of expertise, and I don't have any expertise as it relates to the wage question. But I think that's the bigger and more important question, almost. Because housing, you know, raising wages across the board, I, I'm not talking about raising minimum wages, but like building capacity to earn, um, sure. affects so many things more than housing, right? And so I, I kind of feel like that that would be super interesting. I'd, I'd love to, you know, hear about that, but that's another intractable problem. And unlike with housing, where we can actually focus on one quote commodity and we can manipulate it and try to make it better and we can, again, reframe it such that we're ignoring the bigger problems. I don't know how you do that with wage growth, right? So I think that's probably why there's like less of a targeted solution. Sure. Taylor, it's it, I just uh, to follow, it's interesting to think about. Um, I you know I grew up in the Midwest, and and I occasionally go back to uh, places like St. Louis or Cleveland or uh, you know 
cities that are struggling and so on. And, the, you know, the property values, the houses that you can buy there are, um, it's amazing compared to, say, the Boston area. What you, you, you know, what you could buy for $50,000 in some of these places. And, and Worcester is kind of like a, it's kind of like a little mini Midwest <laughs> compared to, compared to, say, the greater Boston area or to Newton or, you know, Watertown or something like that. And it, it's kind of like a, it's like on the frontier. Um, it's almost within reach by transportation. Uh, it is within reach by transportation. And so, so in some ways, um, it's just, it's very interesting to think about the wage gap or the, uh, you know, and also the geographic gap of, of how property values and and um, the, the mismatch between income and housing is exasper exacerbated by uh, big big uh, cities, basically big, you know, big economically strong cities. This is great. Um, Taylor, I'm, I'm kind of exhausted um, from what you've given us to think about. And, uh, I think there there is some kind of hope, and I'm going to have to ask you at some point to come back and, and give us the message of hope. I agree. We'll stew on this for a while, and I think it will motivate us. Um, to, but it, it's great to understand the concept and um, and get the wheels turning on it. Thanks a ton. This is this is great, and I I really enjoyed the the departure from our, our typical subject area. I think it was refreshing and most worthwhile. Well, thanks for everyone's time. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, got this is a really good presentation. Isaiah, you unmute. I can. You want to jump in? I was just saying thanks to Taylor. That was. A good departure, like you said. Uh, not something I deal with in my everyday life. I should probably care more about it. Yeah, it was great. Important subject. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Taylor, thank you for the time you put into this. This is great. And uh, yeah, thank you for letting us record this because I know there's folks who couldn't make it who are really going to be interested in seeing this presentation so appreciate that and uh thanks all for joining that us and with that i'll say uh we hope to see